Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Hands-On Tutorial Workflow Advances for Whole Cell Correlative Cryomicroscopy. I'm Susie Valdez of Labyrinth, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labyrinth and brought to you by Leica Microsystems and Aviol. To learn more about our sponsors, please visit them at the sponsor logos on the left side of your screen. So let's get started. I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice you can share this webinar on your personal social media. Just click on the social sharing tab and let your friends and colleagues know about today's live event. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, simply click on that support tab found at the top right of your presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Liz Wright. And also joining Dr. Wright for our live question and answer session will be Dr. Jay Yang, Dr. Brian Seibert, and Joseph Kim. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Wright, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar a hands-on tutorial about workflows for correlative light and electron microscopy for cell biology. We would like to thank our sponsors and co-organizers, Leica Microsystems and Alveol Labs. We would also like to thank LabRoots for hosting the webinar series. As mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Wright. I am a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our research group focuses on questions related to infectious disease and human cell dysfunction. We develop and use a range of cryocorrelative imaging methods in our research. I would like to introduce three other presenters for this webinar and webinar series. Dr. Jay Yang is a cryo-EM biophysicist in the group and develops light microscopy, cryo-EM, and cryo methods and software tools. Dr. Brian Seibert is a structural virologist on the team. He develops and uses light microscopy, cryo-EM, and cryo workflows for virology research. Mr. Joseph Kim is a PhD student in physical chemistry at UW-Madison. He develops and uses light microscopy, cryo-EM, and cryo workflows for neuroscience research. If you missed our first webinar or would like a refresher on its content in the future, you may access the material at LabRoots. The webinar, Correlative Cryoimaging for Cell Biology, was presented on June 11, 2020. In that webinar, we introduced CryoEM at UW-Madison, highlighted major emphasis areas in structural biology, and connections to CryoEM and CLEM. We discussed some of the theoretical and practical aspects of labeling biological targets and included research examples. We also discussed CLEM equipment, options, and workflows, including research examples. I presented some future areas for CLEM technology development and a few suggestions about resources. To get us started, here is a brief overview of today's webinar. I will introduce CryoEM at UW-Madison and mention some key reasons for why cryo and why clem. From there, I will discuss cryo clem equipment options, workflows, and laboratory layout requirements. At this point, I will move us into a practical discussion of micro patterning with the alveol Primo system and cryo clem with the Leica EM cryo clem. I will present some future areas for clem technology development. I will then provide a few suggestions about resources, make a few acknowledgments, and point to our future webinar events. 
The Wright Lab moved to UW-Madison in 2018 to begin our next phase of work in cryo-EM structural studies of host pathogen systems. Simultaneously, we set out to build a cryo-EM research center at UW-Madison in the Department of Biochemistry to support the research endeavors of investigators across the UW campus, regionally, nationally, and internationally. We have assembled a team of the PI, two staff scientists, Eric and Matt, four postdoctoral research associates, Jay, Brian, Julene, and Daniel, and two graduate students, Joe and Juan. Members of the group are engaged in facility management and technology development, research projects in the area of infectious disease and neuroscience, and cryo-EM education. We are always on the lookout for new team members. In addition to our team, we have a suite of instrumentation to support all major cryo-EM workflows from the basics of sample optimization by negative stain TEM, single particle data collection, and 3D map determination. We specialize in areas associated with cryo and cryo-electron tomography and have built resources to support studies of biological targets from light level imaging through cryo sample milling, and cryo-ET data collection, 3D reconstruction, rendering, and subvolume averaging. The members of the team and instrumentation are essential for the success of cryo-EM studies in the Wright Lab and the Cryo-EM Research Center at UW-Madison. Why are researchers actively developing strategies that use fluorescent flight microscopy, CLEM, and cryo-EM? Briefly, cryo-EM technologies were pioneered to retain specimen hydration and reduce electron beam radiation damage to the biological sample while imaged in the vacuum of the electron microscope. These advances allow data to be collected that could be computationally processed to generate native 3D structures of macromolecules from nanometer to atomic resolution levels. In kind, fluorescence light microscopy was developed for resolving targets of interest during the imaging of a living or fixed specimen. Finally, correlative light and electron microscopy, or CLEM technologies and methods, grew from the need to define the 3D structures of macromolecular complexes by EM that has been spatially resolved in biological samples by light microscopy. In cryo-CLEM, the goal is to achieve direct correlation data from the specimen. As we consider the cryo-EM workflow to use, so much depends on the biological question. What is the target? An isolated macromolecule or macromolecular complex? Whole cells, perturbed cells, or tissue? Simultaneous to the considerations of biological target, selection of the technologies used for sample preservation and imaging will also impact the relationship between context and achievable resolution. When we move forward with a research project, we consider the workflow in four phases. Sample op optimization and preparation, specimen preservation, imaging pathway, and computation and data analysis. For this series of webinars, we will focus on the central pipeline for imaging impact cells for light microscopy, cryofluorescence light microscopy, and cryoelectron tomography. We are all investigating exciting biological questions that may benefit from light and electron microscopy imaging. However, we may not know what resources we need for addressing these questions and whether we should house them in our own laboratories or use them as part of a shared resource. There are many options available for equipment and decisions regarding the systems to purchase and use depend on many experimental factors that are generally determined during the initial development of a project and refined over the course of the investigation. For the ideal and highly automated cryo-CLEM workflows, 
One will need access to live cell imaging systems, a plunge freezer, cryoclem microscope, a cryofit stem for sample thinning, and a cryo-TEM. While we build out a repertoire of equipment to support light microscopy, cryo-EM, and cryoclem studies in our own labs and in shared research facilities, a critical component for overall success is the laboratory design and layout. At UW-Madison, we spent considerable time designing and building dedicated cryo-EM research laboratories. Here in this architectural drawing, we illustrate the layout of our 900 square foot biosafety level two certified tissue culture, CLEM imaging, and cryo-EM preparative laboratory. The entire laboratory is rated for BSL-1 and BSL-2 work. This includes the appropriate safeguards for room access, airflow and circulation, environmental safety controls, and PPE and training for personnel. The laboratory has a dedicated HVAC system to maintain constant temperature and low relative humidity levels necessary for minimizing frost and ice contamination to cryo-specimens during cycles of specimen preparation, transfer, and imaging. We incorporated two tissue or cell culture rooms in the overall footprint to maintain a close proximity between the wet lab work, a live cell imaging system, the cryopreparative equipment, and the cryo -clem system. This layout supports our efforts to minimize handling and transport risks two samples that may be delicate or when the timing between steps is critical. Overall, our varied research objectives have been successful in part due to the lab design. How do we practically do cryoclem? We have developed a cryoclem workflow that includes standard operating procedures in areas that may require optimization to improve success rates of cryoclem experiments for the novice and experienced practitioner. This workflow is conveniently color-coded to help the investigator work through each step and the associated steps of the process. Two areas within the workflow are called out with red and blue boxes for two reasons. First, when working with cell cultures, both eukaryotic and prokaryotic, it is critical to maintain a sterile working environment using the appropriate environmental controls and the use of aseptic or sterile techniques to eliminate possible sources of sample contamination. Second, once samples have been plunge frozen, it is essential to maintain the samples, tools, and equipment at temperatures lower than minus 150 degrees Celsius to minimize specimen devitrification or contamination. In order to help individuals plan and troubleshoot whole cell cryoclem experiments, I will outline a few of the critical steps within the workflow. When we transition to grid preparation, there are a number of considerations. Briefly, one should have a standard set of tools and laboratory equipment to minimize specimen contamination and maintain continuity of research. We prefer to use MathTech dishes for CLEM imaging experiments because they have a glass cover slip in the bottom that allows for periodic light microscopy imaging without the introduction of grid handling steps. We commonly add an additional thin layer of carbon to the grid surface to improve substrate stability and increase cell happiness. Depending on the attributes of the biological target, we may use perforated or continuous carbon films. We may also add an extracellular matrix protein across the grid to enhance cell adhesion and spreading. At this step, we may define regions of the grid where the extracellular matrix material is applied to encourage ordered cell adhesion and spreading. Finally, we add both fluorescent and electron-dense markers to the sample to support correlation and image alignment during the reconstruction process. 
An area of development in our lab and in other labs is micropatterning to support complex cell culturing experiments and improved automation through GLEM pipeline. The leading rationale for micropatterning is that cells, be they eukaryotic or prokaryotic, do not grow in two dimensions or in isolation. Therefore, technologies can be developed to support the expansion of the native in situ microenvironments on a substrate. This will increase our capacity to understand fundamental cell biology and design experiments to tease out architectural, mechanical, physiological, and other structural and functional relationships present between cells and tissues and organ systems. To support our light microscopy, micropatterning, and CLEM imaging experiments, we designed a dedicated light microscopy imaging lab within the temperature and humidity controlled Biosafety Level 2 laboratory footprint. A workbench for sample prep and handling, a Leica DMI-8 with the Alveol Primo system, and a Leica EM CryoClim unit are in the suite. Each microscope is on an air table to dampen vibrations. The systems are housed in close proximity to incubators in the tissue culture labs, as well as the plunge freezing instruments, thus making transitions between the culturing, imaging, and sample vitrification steps seamless. The light microscope is a Leica DMI-8 onto which the Alveol Primo micropatterning system is mounted. The entire system is very compact and also supports longer time course live cell imaging experiments with the addition of an incubating chamber. This is a user-friendly system for imaging and micropatterning. The PC runs three main software packages, Micromanager for basic and custom imaging experiments, the Leica LASX for correlation experiments, and the Alveol Leonardo for micropatterning. In this schematic from Alveol Labs, we review the basic steps in the maskless photo patterning process. First, the substrate, such as an EM grid or a light microscope cover slip, is coated with an anti-fouling agent, i.e. PEG, and then the photoactivatable PLP, the liquid or gel agent. Second, the user will prepare a pattern with a basic image creation software. The pattern can be simply a regular pattern of ordered lines to complex patterns that include multiple geometries and possibly gradients within the pattern. The pattern is then transferred to the Leonardo software that will control the substrate patterning process on the microscope. Third, the substrate is loaded onto the microscope platform, registered, and then with UV illumination, the pattern is introduced onto the coated substrate. The illumination process causes local degradation of the PEG polymer. This material and the excess PLPP agent is rinsed away. In the fourth step, the user applies an extracellular matrix material, antibodies, or other biological agent. This material will remain only where the patterning process occurred. Finally, one is able to seed cells at an appropriate density onto the pattern substrate. At this point, we recommend visiting the Alveo Lab website to watch a complete video tutorial on TEM grid micropatterning. In addition, there are links to several papers from the cryoEM community on the use of micropatterning in cell biology. Also, please reach out to the Alveo Lab team and the growing user community. We are happy to share our experiences. We hope you take the time to visit the Alveo Lab website for more information. In Brian and Joe's experience, the most critical steps to consider for the cells are the design of the pattern 
and the selection of the ECM material. It is important to keep the cell type in mind, in particular, what is known about their native environment. For the patterning process, Use a stencil to maintain grid support and hydration on the cover slip or mat tech dish. In addition, during the incubation periods, keep the grids hydrated in a light protective container. Finally, how long does the process take? In our hands, we are able to move from pattern design to cell seeding on eight grids in a matter of five hours which is very comparable to normal work with regular grids. In this experiment, Brian and Jay patterned a substrate to support the adhesion and spreading of BAS2B cells on an EM grid. BAS2B cells are a human lung epithelial cell line that is commonly used for functional and structural studies of respiratory pathogens. The two images on the left are from the ATCC and show how BAS2B cells spread across the substrate when they have been seeded either at low or high density. In our experiment, Brian and Jay used a line pattern for several reasons. First, BAS2B cells tend to spread and extend in a linear fashion. We aim to replicate this order present under standard cell culturing conditions. Note the semi-linear order of the individual cells in the ATCC images. Second, to orient the cells and have them spread over the central region of an EM grid square. The line pattern supports an even and regular distribution of the cells across the entire EM grid without cell clumping or disruption of the underlying EM grid structure. Furthermore, with extended regions of the cell periphery, we would have greater opportunity for locating and imaging regions of virus entry and attachment or virus assembly. Throughout the process, the BAS2B cells were monitored by live cell imaging and subsequently cryopreserved for our cryoclem and cryoEM imaging. And in panel C and D, you can see the micropatterned uh, line. And then in D, you can resolve the cells present in those micropattern lines. In panels E and F, we have fluorescence microscopy images that illustrate the positioning of those cells in those particular regions of the grid. In this experiment, Brian and Jay patterned several substrates to support the adhesion and growth of HeLa cells. HeLa cells are a commonly used model cell line for studies of cell structure and function and host pathogen interactions. The two images on the left are from the ATCC and show how HeLa cells spread across the substrate when they have been seeded at either low or high density. In this experiment, the triangular pattern was, used, was generated for several reasons. First, to replicate the basal level order that HeLa cells tend to have under standard cell culturing conditions. Note their semi-triangular order of the individual cells. And second, to orient the spreading cells to the central regions of an EM grid square. As can be seen, this pattern supports the even and regular distribution of cells across the entire EM grid, as you can see in panel B. And in panel C and D, we can see the pattern and then the cells spreading across the pattern without cell clumping or disruption to the underlying EM grid structure. Once again, the HeLa cells were monitored by live cell imaging and subsequently cryopreserved for cryoclin and cryoEM imaging. And in panel G, 
You can see several of the cells have thick eyes present over the top of them, but they are organized in the triangular pattern. Once you have cultured your cells on the substrate and defined the time points at which the biological process should be preserved, it's time to vitrify or plunge freeze the grid. There are many options available for sample preservation. Routinely, we plunge freeze whole cell specimens with the Leica EMGP. The Leica EMGP is an automated plunge freezing unit that has an environmental chamber that can be calibrated to maintain specific temperature and humidity levels. To remove excess liquid from the grid, the system has a single blotter that can be programmed to blot a sample from the front or back side once or multiple times sequentially. The binoculars allow users to visualize the calibration process so that sample application and blotting are reproducible. The computer control panel allows the user to enter experimental details, including temperature and humidity values, ethane doer temperature, and blotter conditions. A double doer system is present for condensing ethane in a safe, controlled manner. Forceps or tweezers are used for holding the EM grid. And the refillable water chamber serves to regulate humidity in the environmental chamber. Outlined below on this page are the major steps in operating the Leica EMGP. The link will also bring you to a YouTube video about the Leica EMGP. In total, the entire process for setting up the unit and freezing a small batch of grids takes approximately 30 minutes. So, now that you have prepared your sample, imaged it by light microscopy, and vitrified it by plunge freezing or high pressure freezing, it is time for cryofluorescence imaging. There are many options available for use. The selection of the system depends on the attributes of the particular system as well as the biological targets. We decided upon a system that is part of a seamless workflow, has minimal, minimal transfer steps between systems, and methods for handling that eliminate possible sample damage, as well as an imaging and coordinate data uh, housekeeping system that allows for rapid correlation. For our work, we have had great success with the Leica EM cryoclem system for studies of bacteria, human cells, and virus-infected cells. The Leica cryoclem has 11 major components. The liquid nitrogen pump for cooling the cryo stage, the temperature control unit that regulates pump function and monitors system temperatures, the DM6 microscope, a 50x thermally isolated cryo objective, the cryoclim stage that supports loading and imaging of two samples, the overall microscope control unit, the stage control unit, the cryo transfer shuttle used for loading grids into the chuck and onto the cryoclim stage, a fluorescent light source, a CMOS or other type of camera, and the PC with the LASX and other software components. As with all steps in cryo-EM workflows, the most sensitive steps are those that include sample handling by us, i.e. by human hands. This is the reason many systems for cryo-sample processing to cryo-imaging have automated sequences, multi-specimen options, and robotic elements. Leica has engineered a cryotransfer shuttle that helps to minimize the number of touches. First, note that the cartridge holds two grids under liquid nitrogen temperature. In this video, you will see three options for loading EM grids into the cartridge. For easier viewing, the processes were demonstrated at room temperature. The first is loading a pre-clipped grid with specialized support tweezers. Pre-clipping gold or other fragile grids into an auto grid can be a good idea because the grids are extremely fragile 
and easily damaged. The second option is to load the pre-clipped grids with standard tweezers. The final method is to load bare grids using regular tweezers and a grid alignment tool that is removed prior to transferring the grid cartridge to the cryo -clim. As you've seen, we have a robust workflow for cryo -clim studies of virus-infected cells. This workflow relies on tools from Alveo, the Primo system, and Leica, namely the EMGP and the EM CryoClim. With these tools in hand, we are developing improved routines for better op automation and correlation between the cryofluorescence microscope and the cryo-EM data. Here, Jay demonstrates the steps of an improved workflow for correlation between the cryofluorescence microscope from, like, from the LICO cryo-clem and the cryo-EM data from the, a 300 kV side entry microscope. The data is of an RSV infected cell where virus replication competent cells are indicated in red and the native immunolabeled virus particles fluoresce green. So, once you have prepared your specimens, loaded them into the cryo transfer shuttle, you are ready to begin CLEM imaging. As you see here, Joe is ready at the microscope. Notice that he is in appropriate PPE and he's wearing a face mask, not only because we are in COVID-19 times, but because any humidity from our breath that lands on the EM grid can cause devitrification or ice contamination. In the next two slides, we will review the steps associated with imaging a single Primo micropatterned cryo-EM grid on the Leica cryoclone. The entire process per grid, depending on grid quality, target number of regions of interest, and number of fluorescence channels needed may take up to one and a half hours. We performed this experiment with a single Primo micropatterned cryo-EM grid. The cryo imaging took one and a half hours. On this grid, EAS2B cells were cultured and subsequently infected with RSV. The video captures screenshots of the 21 steps of the grid mapping and imaging process in the LASX matrix screener. The first 10 steps take approximately 20 minutes and set up the basic imaging conditions for the grid. In step one, the grid template and the grid are aligned and the user selects the imaging parameters such as the filter cube sets, camera exposure times, and single or multiple channels per position. In steps two through four, the user sets up the imaging parameters for focus and selects the focus positions. In steps five and six, the user runs the focus map at the pre-selected focus positions across the entire grid. Now, in steps seven through 10, the user often reruns with some manual input the focus routines at selected positions to fine tune the parameters. The next six steps will set up the mosaic acquisition and generally takes about 10 minutes to complete. In step 11, the user defines the mosaic areas for the data to be acquired. In steps 12 through 15, the imaging conditions for the mosaics are refined and may include adjustments to the filter sets, exposure time, and Z-stack heights. In step 16, the export parameters are validated and adjusted if needed. During steps 17 through 19, the grid mosaic is acquired. <clears throat> this process may take up to 40 minutes, depending on the number of channels used, height of the V-stack, sampling steps used, and areas collected. The final two steps of the cryo imaging process are to identify and mark registration points over the entire grid, i.e. yellow markers, in step 20, 
and then identify targets of interest for cryo-EM data collection. Squares with green points and objects of interest are blue points. This is step 21. And now, at last, you are finished. You may continue to the second grid or finish the process, save and export your data, and recover your grid for transfer to the cryo-EM. So you have made it. You have loaded your sample into the cryo-TEM. You have your maps and navigator files. Now what? Briefly, with five screen captures from Serial EM on a Titan Creos, we will walk you through the major correlation steps on the previous Primo micro-patterned grid. The first step is to import the cryoclem mosaic the image then you will import the navigator registration points noted in yellow from there you will transfer the cryoclem image and the navigator points this is followed by the transform process that will allow the image and the navigator points to transfer to the TEM map pink and red markers. Now that you have a large scale map and the points are in register, you can begin to work on finer correlation processes at the level of the grid square, hole, and object of interest. In this cryo-TEM image, we can see the orientation of the BAS-2B cell along the same trajectory as the primo micro-patterned area. So it's in this orientation. These blobs here are just thicker ice that can occur across the EM grid. In this webinar, we have presented details about the practical hands-on aspects of cell culture, EM substrate micropatterning, and cryoclem. In our next webinar, to be held in August, we will present a robust correlation software solution with a user-friendly graphical user interface that seamlessly integrates with any LM and EM instrument. This teaser data is of an RSV-infected cell where the native immunolabeled virus particles fluoresce green. In the cryo-ET reconstruction, we resolve the structure of the virus particle that was identified on the cryofluorescence microscope map. Of note, the label used was fluoro-nanogold, and we are able to resolve the nanogold particles associated with the F or fusion glycoprotein on the surface of the virus particles. And now, as with all areas in structural biology, we are looking at the future of cryoclem imaging. Are there improvements to the methods and technologies that will lead to better and faster results? Yes, we can consider a range of improvements. In particular, we are interested in improving substrates and cell culturing methods through micropatterning and microfluidics, as we demonstrated today with the Alveo Primo system. We are also engaged in developing improved automation routines through software and hardware advances, which we will discuss in our next uh, webinar series. As you have seen throughout the webinar, we have a robust workflow for cryoclim studies of cells and virus-infected cells. This workflow relies on tools from Albeol Labs and Leica Microsystems, mainly the DMI-8 microscope with the Albeol Primo system, the EMGP, and the EM Cryoclim. With these tools in hand, we are developing improved routines for cell culture 
along with better automation and correlation between cryofluorescence microscopy and cryo-EM data. Everyone always asks, what is next? How do I begin my project? Where do I start? Here I have included a list of resources within the community and from Leica and Alveo Labs. There are numerous ways to connect with cryo-EM and light microscopy experts. We are all always happy to help answer your questions. I'd like to acknowledge a few members of our team. Historically, cryoclin developments in the group were led by Sherry Hampton, Josh Strauss, Rebecca Dillard, John Longke, and Hong Yi. Our latest advances at UW Madison have been pioneered by the efforts of Jay Yang, Brian Seibert, and Joseph Kim. We have also had wonderful support from our colleagues at Leica, Louise Bertrand, and Nancy Rizzo, and at Alveo Labs from Aurelien Dubois and Serge Kadura. I'd like to highlight our upcoming webinars in the series, and these are webinars that focus on some of our scientific results. As mentioned in August, we will have a webinar that discusses some improvements for the automation routines for correlative microscopy. Uh, and then later on, we will have two webinars to discuss how we can use correlative imaging to investigate host pathogen interactions, as well as how we can advance these routines to study complex cell-to-cell -cell interactions. We really appreciate your attention today, uh, and we now pause for questions. Thank you, Dr. Wright, for that informative presentation. And welcome, Dr. Seibert and Dr. Yang and Dr. Johnson. Welcome, all of you. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of those questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question coming in is for you, Liz. What difference does it make to use Primo, Primo to prepare my cell samples for cryo-ET? Thanks, this is an excellent question. So in using the Primo system to prepare cell, cell samples for cryo-ET, we can really work well to ensure that the sample is well positioned in the center of the grid squares. So this facilitates uh, data collection in the cryofluorescence microscope and under cryofib milling or cryo-ET conditions. And so this can also help control cell density so that we don't have too many cells growing on the grid. We can really position them well. Because if we see too many cells on an EM grid, we can uh, have very thick ice once the sample's uh, vitrified, which makes it challenging to acquire cryo-ET data unless we are incorporating fib milling into the routine. Is primal micro-patterning technique compatible with all EM grids? And is it causing some damages to those grids? Hi, yes, thank you. I'll try this again. Um, so we have found it to be compatible with all carbon EM grids, and we've used a variety of those grids in our lab, other groups have also had success with silicone substrate grids. And I would direct people to the Primo and Alveol website to really see the versatility of uh, what Primo can be used for. As far as damage, uh, we do not see any damage to the grids throughout the process. And we routinely check the grids by light microscopy at several points in the process, including during and after patterning, 
after the extracellular matrix addition and after cell seeding immediately prior to freezing. And we don't observe any damage at those points, nor when we put it in the cryo-EM microscope. Thank you, Brian. And this next question is for you, Joe. How can I be sure my micro patterns are aligned with the frame of the EM grid mesh? So the Leonardo software allows you to visualize the position of the projected pattern that's overlaid with the bright field image of your grid and adjust the position of the pattern if necessary, whether it's by rotation or translation. If one thinks that the orientation of the pattern within the square is not as of a high priority, there is an automated positioning workflow that is included in the software. Thank you so much, Joe. And again, I want to thank our audience. These are great questions that are coming in. This next question is actually for you again, Joe. Which cells can be micro-patterned on EM grids? Thank you. This is an excellent question. Um, at present, we believe there is a great variety of cells that can be micro-patterned onto the EM grid. The success of such specific cell type would depend on optimizing the pattern along with finding the appropriate extracellular matrix type as well as the concentration. As a matter of fact, we have recently begun to micropattern EM grids for trickier cell types, such as astrocyte-like cell lines as well as primary neurons. Thank you. And this next question is for you, Jay. Is the cryoclim used the main user interface of LASX, or is it using the CLEM workflow that is based LASX and matrix screener? Um, good question. So all of the data presented here is actually in the matrix screener module, but if you have the main screen um, that functions on your software, which is the embedded LAX workflow, you can also collect your grid montage there. It can also be Z stacks, but uh, you probably cannot make the coordinate point for the registration of the uh, image position. That would require other softwares to do the uh, coordinates transfer. Thank you so much. And we're going to come back to you, Brian. Without using micro patterning, would the cell grow randomly on the grid? And is micro patterning absolutely necessary? Hi, that's a great question. Uh, without micropatterning, the cells do grow randomly on the grid, except they have a preference to actually grow above the metal grid support bars where they can't be imaged. Uh, without patterning, if you're very careful with seeding uh, your cell density, you do get some grid squares that have a nice distribution of cells and that are well positioned for imaging but micropatterning definitely enhances the number of cells that are well positioned for cryo-EM imaging compared to seeding the cells randomly on the grid. Thank you for that. And Jay, using the cryo-CLIM cryo workflow, you mentioned there's a possibility to export the coordinate as NAV to a cryo-EM. Is this work for any type of cryo EM if we are using serial EM to control the electron microscope? Uh, good question. Uh, yeah, because uh, the LAX, the software, supports multiple various of the formats when you export those coordinates. So one of those formats are serial EM navigator files, and those navigator files can be um, imported into serial EM and then correlated with serial EM for later on. Yeah, so it's suitable for all types of the cryo-cleaning combination of serial that controls the microscope. Thank you for that. And Liz, back to you. Do you find that micro-patterning technique to really save time and cost in the end it, as it adds more steps to the overall workflow? Yeah, this is a... Uh, great question for anyone who's thinking about doing whole cell cryo uh, EM and cryo clem. So in many cases, the time and cost savings really depends on your project goal uh, and the cells that you're working with and all those different attributes. 
in many cases, Primo can increase the number of potential imaging targets per grid over uh, unpatterned cell seeding. So this makes it, uh, you have a more seamless workflow from your cryofluorescence microscope to your cryofib, and then finally into your cryo-EM. However, as with all things, there could be extra time and cost investments uh, due to micropatterning, but in the end, we feel that the balance of having more usable uh, cells and information to gather at the final end of the workflow uh, outweighs those uh, components. Thank you for that. And we're going to swing back over here to you, Brian. For sectioning, please specify the cell density. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And unfortunately, it's one that really depends on the cell type um, that you're seeding on the grid. So we generally use something like 10 to the fourth cells per mil um, on the grid, but that again, it changes based on the cell type. Um, so that's something that you really need to determine for your specific cells um, on the grid. Thank you so much for that. And I just want to thank our audience. We have so many great questions coming in. We're going to try to answer as many as possible before we close today. Any questions not answered will be answered via email by our presenters. So let's take a look. Joe, here's a question for you. Sorry, it might be a silly question, says the audience member, but coming from a single particle, an ET world, is glow discharging adopted when working with cells on grids? Hi, this is actually an excellent question. And what I would say is that um, because the grids will be making contact with solution, regardless of whether it's in single particle or cell cryo ET world, um, it is recommended that you do indeed glow discharge your grids before it starts making contact with um, solutions of, say, the cell aliquot for which you want to see your grid onto. So it's recommended that you go discharge a grid um, right before the seeding process starts or before you begin micropatterning. Thank you so much. And Jay, I thought the sample still gets very quickly degraded from the electron beam in cryo-EM. Is that true? Uh, yeah, it is true. Um, just like all of the cryo samples, biological samples, you still need to image your samples in low dose mode under the um, electron microscope. Thank you very much. And back to you, Liz, our audience member first says, great presentation. How do you envision microfluidic technologies playing a role in cell preparation for cryo electrons? Thermography of a cell. Yeah, so this is a great question. Uh, so in our current setups, where we're grow culturing cells on on a variety of different substrates, including EM grids uh, that are made of carbon and copper or gold, in the case of growing cells on grids or silicon-based uh, materials. Um, most people are just growing these in culture media and, and allowing them to just propagate as, as they would. But in thinking more expansively, if we are patterning the grids and encouraging the, them to, the cells to grow in particular arrangements, we can then think about how we can incorporate microfluidics into their routine so that then we could gently transition the media that the cells are culturing in. We'd have to develop novel platforms to put the cells on in microfluidic chambers so that then we could do time course experiments of transitioning uh, culture media to some other agent to see how this changes uh, cell ultrastructure in response to uh, the changing uh, physiological environment. Is it possible to use FID milling for determining larger complexes in the cell membrane? What is the resolution limit in this case? 
I think for determining the larger complex in the cell membrane, it really depends on the labeling. When we're using cryoclone, there is a resolution limit, especially when you are using the wide field imaging. And generally, it achieves between 400 to 800 nanometers, and it depends on the fluorophores you're using, and also some image processing afterwards that you are doing to restore your PSF, the point spread function. Uh, so that actually determines a lot whether or not you can find it when you are doing the film milling. Um, so I think it's a very practical question, really depends on um, what you're looking at and your labeling and your sample. Thank you so much, Jay. I really appreciate you responding to that. And I want to thank all of you for presenting today and for you, Liz, for, for your presentation. Would you like to provide any closing remarks before we close today? Sure. Again, we'd like to thank uh, Life of Microsystems, Albio Labs, and of course, LabRoots for hosting uh, this webinar series. Just remember, uh, this is our second uh, webinar in, in the five-part series, and so we'll host another one in August where we'll be discussing how to uh, do adv more advanced correlation uh, between cryofluorescence microscopy and cryoelectron tomography. I'd also like to thank my other speakers today, Jay Yang, Brian Seibert, and Joe Kim. And thank you, our and audience, also for attending. And I'd also like to thank you all again for, for all of your work here, Dr. Liz Wright, Dr. Brian Seibert, Dr. Jay Yang, Joseph Kim. Thank you all for your presentation today and for your contribution. We would also like to thank LabRoot and our sponsors, Lyco Microsystems and Aviol, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I want to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information we provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, be safe, have a great day, bye-bye.